Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, before we begin this study, I want to make very clear that this is not my intent to change your beliefs, only to challenge them. It is with this challenge I present to you the following information. The heart of the teaching of any end time study is where will Christians be during this period of time. Now to better understand this, there are several views. Pre-trib, not on earth, mid-trib, on earth for a part, and post-trib, on earth for all. I have been challenged in this study and have spent countless hours researching the facts I am about to present to you. I realize that this will be extremely uncomfortable for many, and I encourage you to think deeply for yourself before coming to any conclusion. Try very hard not to allow your emotions or preconceived beliefs to get in the way, but simply to take the Bible for what it is clearly saying. Listen for Jesus to speak to you through his written word. His sheep hear his voice. Very few of us like being told we, or even those we admire, are wrong, or that what we have been told our entire lives may be or is wrong. There are countless people who have found themselves wrestling with this very topic that we will be discussing today. Some notable ones are William Booth. John Bunyan, Franz DeLich, Jonathan Edwards, John Fox, John Gill, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Charles Finney, Matthew Henry, Ronald Rasmussen, John Knox, Cotton Mather, George Mueller, Isaac Newton, A.W. Pink, William Tyndale, Charles Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, George Whitfield, and John Wycliffe, to name a few. Now, many of these names you may be familiar with, and they spent many years coming to a conclusion on this very topic. Each one of these great men of Christian history found themselves challenging the teaching of pre-tribulation and eventually converted their beliefs to a post-tribulation, pre-wrath view. But why did they change? Many notable scholars and teachers today teach the pre-tribulation doctrine. Who is right? What are we to believe? The Bible, dear friends. We believe the Bible over any and all teachings and over any and all men. Scripture and Scripture alone is the standard by which everything must be judged. If you approach end-time scriptures with a predetermined theological mindset and then try to make scripture fit into your theology, you are doing yourself a great disservice in receiving the truth of the Bible. The question then is if, and I say if, the Bible teaches post-tribulation pre-wrath and does not teach pre-tribulation, are we willing to forsake our prior beliefs and conform to the teaching of God's holy word. Will we go along to get along, or will we stand true to the Bible no matter the cost? Will we listen to and obey man, or will we listen to and obey God? Let us be reminded of Romans chapter 3 verse 4, which says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. Change is growth. And growth means change. Are we willing to change so that we may grow thereby? That is the decision we are going to be left with today. But before we make any decisions or get too uncomfortable too early in our study, let's examine what God's Word tells us. Now, as I briefly mentioned, and what has caused me much concern leading me into this investigation for biblical truth, is the fact that before the year 1830, there is not a single recorded document or a single shred of proof anywhere on the teaching 
of the pre-tribulation rapture. That's right, nothing, nada, zilch. Do your own research and check it out for yourself if you doubt me. This is a proven fact by scholars and biblical theologians far greater than you or me, friends. So we would be wise to pay attention to it. Even John Wolverd, one of the foremost authorities on pre-tribulationism, admits that there is not a single clear scripture that teaches pre-tribulationism. And I quote him, Not one, friends. Keep that in the back of your mind as we continue in this study. Now, I would like to begin with two passages of Scripture. First, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, which read, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The second verse that I would like to note is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, which read, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, having just read the above passages, does this next verse sound like the rapture to you? This is found in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and 31, which reads, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now I asked you, does this verse sound like the previous two verses that we read which indicate the rapture of the people of God. If you are like me, your answer was and is yes. But did you know those who consider themselves pre-tribulation scholars claim that this is not a rapture verse? Now, before I explain why, allow me to set some groundwork, a foundation that you may build upon. As I stated earlier, there is no writing no sermon, no teaching in any recorded book, no letter, no thesis papers, not one single anything from any denomination or theologian or historian or anyone anywhere of Christian heritage that taught the pre-tribulation rapture before the year 1830. Now you say, Pastor, why do you keep repeating this? because it is critical to understand that for the first 1,850 years of the Christian teaching, everyone taught and believed we would be here through the reign of the Antichrist rule on earth, including Jesus himself. Now that is so significant in so many ways. If you understand the mission of the Antichrist in his rule, you will understand why the timing of the rapture is so critical to your Christian faith. And more importantly, practice. If we will be here, and I say if, then is it not the most important thing we can do to strengthen our inner man? To get really serious in our relationship with God? To forsake the pleasures and comforts of this world as we was warned so many times by Jesus which make us his enemy, James chapter 4, verse 4, and become steadfastly disciplined students in his word while it is still available to us. We will address and discuss this more in detail as we progress through this study. For now, I want you to simply ponder and think on this idea. So where did the pre-tribulation teaching come from anyway, you ask? Well, it came from a man named John Nelson Darby, 
Darby began to teach what he called the secret rapture in 1830. It is said that the secret rapture of the church is so secret that up until 1830, not even the church knew about it. Darby produced his own translation of the Bible from which he removed entire verses. He corrupted important biblical doctrines, and he tampered with key biblical passages concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, John Darby is known as the father of modern dispensationalism. This is simply a fancy word which basically means how God works over certain periods of time. His teaching gained widespread acceptance among Baptists when Oxford University Press published the Schofield Reference Bible, which contains marginal notes promoting the concept of Darby's secret rapture. These notes have caused many Christians to embrace this doctrine as though God had said it himself. But they are simply notes in that Bible, friend. They are not part of the written word of God. The Schofield Reference Bible in the early 1900s became the number one Bible used in churches and Christian colleges throughout the world and thereby furthered the pre-tribulation teaching invented yes, invented by Darby. In 1970, a film entitled A Thief in the Night was released and played a major role in indoctrinating an entire new generation to this unbiblical teaching. Now, don't write me off yet. I said unbiblical, and you will soon see why. Over 500 million people have seen this movie, A Thief in the Night, to date, and believe in its teaching. Why? Because they believe the message of the movie without testing it to God's holy word. I must admit, I am surprised at myself at how easily it has been for me to accept this view from my upbringing without even thinking of challenging it until now. Maybe you too will find yourself in my same position in a few moments. In 1995, Tyndale House Publishing introduced a new series of books called Left Behind. These books were authored by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, to again, the newest generation. And to date, it has sold over 65 million copies. God himself only knows the amount of actual people who have read them and been influenced by their unbiblical propaganda. The movies have done fairly well at the box office, and the latest of the four in the series featured Nicolas Cage as its main character after being picked up by Sony Films in 2004, Nicolas Cage being a famous movie actor which has further increased the indoctrination of this unbiblical doctrine. Now this teaching has become a central part of American culture and belief even among unbelievers. But is it true? Is it biblical? Is this what Jesus taught and his early church? Now, please do not misunderstand me. The rapture is clearly taught in the Bible and will definitely take place. But in this study, we want to examine scripture as to when the rapture will occur. If, like many of us have been taught, it occurs before the seven-year tribulation period known as Jacob's trouble or the 70th week of Daniel, then we have nothing to prepare for. But if we have been taught wrong, millions are unprepared and the coming persecution and suffering will lead many to take the mark of the beast to avoid such pain and misery and death at the hand of the Antichrist. Now again, let me warn you. Be careful in saying you will gladly lay your head upon the chopping block when most of us cannot even discipline ourselves to read our Bible or pray every day or obey the teachings of the Bible in keeping ourselves unspotted from sin and the world or telling others about Jesus and his commands or endure the mocking for standing for Jesus from others or visiting our neighborhoods warning them of the impending judgment to come. If we can't put down the things of this world, 
How will we lay our heads on a chopping block? How will we die for the Lord Jesus? Let's be careful not to deceive ourselves here. If you are too comfortable and occupied with your life now and satisfying its lust in every little whim and fancy, your life and saving it will be the most important thing to you then. That is why Jesus teaches us to die daily so that when that moment does come, it will be no different than what we are already accustomed to, dying daily. If we have been denying our flesh and killing its desires on a daily basis already, then death will be nothing new for us. I hope that that makes sense to you. Now, because of these facts that the pre-tribulation is found in nothing anywhere before 1830, and without speculating as to what scripture is saying, we are left to take the Bible at face value. In other words, we are to understand the Bible as it presents itself, without speculation or manipulation of the text. We are told that God is not a God of confusion. So, neither is his word or its teaching. Man has confused it, not God. Through movies, books, preaching, and teaching, and simply echoing what we have heard others say so often without any research on our own part. But what does God say? What does his word teach us on this topic? Now, this may seem to be a tedious effort, and I completely understand that. I will attempt to give it in small enough chunks that you can savor the flavor first, and then... After consuming all of the information, you will need to digest it and have your aha moment if you're like me. Please remember the understanding of prophecy and, and formulating correct prophetic beliefs is much like putting together the pieces of a complicated jigsaw puzzle. In putting together a puzzle, one first examines all the pieces. Then he selects the border pieces and begins to assemble the border. After the border of the puzzle is completed, he now works on filling in the center to complete the picture. As we know, to complete the puzzle, we must fit every piece perfectly with its surrounding pieces. When every piece is fitted in, the picture becomes complete. The pieces of the prophecy puzzle are the numerous prophetic verses found throughout the Bible. The border pieces are the prophetic principles set forth in Scripture, such as the principle that God will not allow his children to be subject to his wrath. We see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. And that no one knows the day or hour which was taught to us by Jesus himself. In attempting to formulate a correct prophetic view of future events, one must put all the pieces within this framework so that all the pieces fit together perfectly. In other words, one must establish a prophetic belief system that is in agreement with all of the prophetic principles and all of the prophetic scriptures so there are no contradictions. That is precisely what we are about to attempt. Before we begin, take a moment to bow and ask the Lord Jesus to open your eyes to all truth, to shield you from any error, and free you from any misconceptions of his holy word. Well, let's begin by looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, again, which read, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is, without doubt, the most infamous passage we have regarding the rapture of the followers of Jesus. This is also one of the key verses that many pre-tribulation teachers use when teaching we will be taken before the seven years. But, as in all things, let's examine it in its context. Back up to verse 13, which reads, 
But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Do not sorrow, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, or in the Greek, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The context here is those who are asleep, meaning those who are dead and in the grave. This idea and language is not new. We see it all the way back in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, which says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. We are told in the passage in 1 Thessalonians not to mourn over those sleeping believers like those who have no hope. We have hope. We will see them again at the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's why and how we are to comfort one another, which we are told in verse 18. Now this passage is here to reassure those believers who have lost fellow believers and believing family members not to mourn because we will most definitely meet them again. There is no mention here that we will escape persecution or affliction or tribulation, or suffering. Does this passage even mention the tribulation? No. He doesn't say, comfort one another, you are not going through tribulation. He says, comfort one another that there is a reunion coming unlike any the world has ever seen, praise God. We will meet again. Now, do you see anything in this text about the timing of the rapture? Well, there are three hints if you know your Bible. The first is the Lord Jesus himself will descend in verse 16. The second is a trumpet will sound, verse 16. The third is we will be caught up or raptured to meet him in the air, verse 17. Now, keeping these three aspects, the Lord will descend, a trumpet will sound, and we will be caught up. Keeping these in mind, are you reminded of anything that Jesus taught that sounded like this? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 29 to 31, which says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Let me repeat that. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, as you have noticed, we also see in this verse the same three aspects of the rapture. The Lord descends or appears, a trumpet sounds, and we are gathered or raptured up. These verses in Matthew match perfectly with those in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, which, as I stated, is the most accepted Bible passage for the rapture. So the event here in Matthew chapter 24 must be the rapture as well. Agreed? But notice one very important fact here. It is after the tribulation of those days. 
verse 29. Now turn to Mark chapter 13 and look at verse 24, which says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. This is the parallel passage from Mark matching that in Matthew 24. It is the same text only presented from Mark rather than Matthew. You will also find this same text represented by Luke in Luke chapter 21. Now remember, I told you I would explain why this is not a rapture verse according to scholars who hold to the pre-tribulation view. They say the word elect here in Matthew chapter 24 verse 31 proves that this is for the Jews only. It is not meant for Gentile believers, you or me. But if Mark's record is speaking of the same event which Matthew is and Luke is, which all agree it is, and it is accepted by everyone as the same event, then this next verse changes everything. Look at the end of the discourse Jesus gave in Mark at verse 37, which says, And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. He doesn't say, I say unto the Jews. He says, I say unto all. Jesus ends his discourse in Mark by saying that this is for all, not simply the Jews, but all. So here is what we have seen or learned so far. The rapture is shown in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Matthew and Mark and Luke represent the same signs seen in 1 Thessalonians. They all say it is after, and the elect is all. Now here is where Darby's dangerous tampering with Scripture introduced the great deception. In Matthew 24, the Schofield Bible has in its notes that the elect is Israel. However, the word elect is used 16 times in the Bible. Ten times it refers to believers, Jews or Gentiles. Two times it is specifically for Gentile believers only. One time it is for Jewish believers only. Two times it is used for Jesus the Christ. And one time for the person of Jacob. So obviously, the Bible says specifically that the elect are all of the believers. You need more proof? Okay, turn to Romans chapter 11, verse 7, which reads, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. The rest here is speaking of the Jews. The election is speaking specifically of the followers of Jesus. And it says the election or the followers of Jesus hath obtained it, but the Jews have been blinded. Israel hath not obtained, the election has obtained. Obviously, the election is not Israel alone. Or turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, which says, Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Now, Paul is writing to the believers in Thessalonica, and these are Gentile believers, yet he calls them the elect. No, this argument that only Israel is the elect is heretical and unbiblical. The elect of God who are caught up or raptured in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, are Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, barbarians, and anyone else who has put on the Lord Jesus, put on the new man and become his follower, anyone according to the Bible. I encourage you, if you're having trouble dissecting this truth, place Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 
1 Thessalonians 4 and Revelation 6 all side by side on a piece of paper or poster board and compare them. It may help you to better see the complete picture in this prophetic puzzle. Now it is at this point that most will take you to the day or hour argument, which again, as you will see, holds no water either. The argument here is that because we do not know the day or hour, it could happen at any moment. Stop and think on that for a moment. That makes no sense. Just because we do not know the day or hour of the rapture does not mean it can happen at any time. It simply means we do not know the day or the hour. Many will say that Jesus can come any minute. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, read the following. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering or rapturing together unto him, that you do not be soon shaken in mind. Do not allow yourselves to be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the rapture, shall not come unless there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The falling away mentioned here is when people will either have to flee for their lives or receive the mark of the beast. The falling away is not a gradual migration from the faith as pre-tribulationists claim, but rather it is a mass defection. Also notice, if the church at Thessalonica is pre-trib, why would they be shaken in mind? They would be raptured prior to the tribulation. They would not have to face the Antichrist nor suffer any persecution. Therefore, they would have no reason to be troubled. If, on the other hand, the church at Thessalonica is post-tribulation in their beliefs, then they have every right to be shaken in mind. Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica not to be worried that the tribulation they were presently experiencing was not a foreshadowing of the great tribulation. He tells them that two events must occur first. There must come a falling away, and the man of sin must be revealed. That is why they need not be shaken or troubled. They were concerned that the present tribulation they were going through could have been a foreshadowing of the great tribulation, which is signaled by the falling away and the revealing of the Antichrist. When will the Antichrist be revealed? When he defiles the temple at the midpoint of the tribulation. Notice Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. And he, the Antichrist, shall confirm not sign like we've been told, but he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or seven years. And in the midst of the week or in the middle of the seven year tribulation, he shall cause the sacrifice, the abomination of desolation told to us by Jesus in the gospels and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For that day the rapture shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, or the Antichrist, be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now you'll notice that I pointed out that the Antichrist will confirm, not sign, the covenant with many for one week. Roy Reinhold, author of The Day of the Lord and an expert in Hebrew, has this to say about the verse, and I quote, 
The he mentioned in the text is the same person throughout the verse. Higber is a Hebrew word. It's a hyphal, three ms perfect verb, and the qual root verb is gavar, meaning to be strong, to conquer. A hyphal is causative, and so in this case, the actual usage is, and he, the Antichrist, caused to be made strong, a covenant for the many for one period of seven. In no way does this imply that the Antichrist originates the peace treaty. What it clearly shows is that the Antichrist comes along after the peace treaty is in effect, and he agrees with it and enforces its provisions. Unquote. So, we see very clearly here from the prophecy in Daniel that the Antichrist will not be revealed until the middle of the tribulation. So the idea or teaching that the rapture can occur any minute, plainly speaking, is false. The church at Thessalonica knew something that the church of today does not know. They knew that they would have to go through the tribulation before they were raptured. Even though we know that the rapture will not take place until after the sixth seal is opened, we still do not know the day or hour because we do not know exactly when the sixth seal will be opened. And we do not know how long after the opening of the sixth seal that the rapture will occur. We know the name of that day as the day of the Lord, but no one can give you an exact date for when that day will occur. We only know that it will begin sometime between the abomination of desolation and Armageddon. But that's a very broad period of time. Notice the verse more specifically in Matthew 24, verse 36. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. So what day is that day that Jesus is speaking of? The day known throughout the Bible from cover to cover as the day of the Lord or the day of God's wrath. In Isaiah chapter 13, verses 6 through 13, we read, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now notice this. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, which read, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Now one note here. Remember, God told Noah the second time the world would be destroyed, it would not be by water, but it would be by fire. Well, let's look at Joel chapter 2 verse 31, which says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible 
day of the Lord come. Now, the day of the Lord mentioned here is not a 24-hour day, but a period of time. Let me further explain. The day of the Lord consists of all the seals, and we see one seal alone in Revelation 9, 5 that lasts for five months. So the question should now be, when is the day of the Lord? Well, Jesus told us when it will occur. He says this speaking to John in his revelation in chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, which read, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Now notice this. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Does this not sound precisely like what Jesus explained in Matthew 24, 29 through 31? Friends, it is exactly the same, meaning that the rapture does not happen until the sixth seal, which means we will be here for the first five seals, or those still alive at that time will still be here. Most of us at this point will be sleeping or dead in the grave. It is important to point out that the day of the Lord is the day of God's wrath, and we must be careful here not to confuse the time of tribulation with God's wrath. This is where many become confused and begin to err. Tribulation in the Greek means to crush, to press, to compress, to squeeze in the same way that a vice is used. It is used 32 times in the New Testament, and it never once refers to God's wrath. Every single time it is used, it refers to persecution, affliction, and suffering. So, in summary, the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 is when the celestial events take place, specifically the sun and moon. According to Matthew 24, 29, these events happen after the tribulation. In verse 30, we see then comes the Son of Man together or rapture his elect, which is all of his followers. Therefore, the rapture cannot take place until after the sixth seal is open, until after the sun and moon are darkened and the stars fall from the sky, which means, according to Jesus, we, his people, will endure a great time of suffering during these seven years. So will we be spared from God's wrath? Yes, because the rapture takes place after the tribulation, but before God's wrath. Will we be raptured? Yes, it is the grandest event in the history of the world, and all creation even now groans for it. Will we escape suffering? No, many will be brutally persecuted, tortured, and killed. But we are not to fear, but rather rejoice because our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, praise God. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it says, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are those who have been killed during this great time of suffering. Now you say, Pastor, why is this pre-trib rapture teaching so dangerous and the post-trib teaching so important and necessary? Because Jesus, in his parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, verse 21, said that many will fall away after being persecuted because of the word. That is exactly what is going to take place during the tribulation. Many will be persecuted. Many will endure tribulation, and most because of the word of God. Even more will surrender to the pressure of the great imposter or the Antichrist and worship him as the true and living God. And by this, they will forever seal their fate in an eternity of hell 
which is found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 10. Now, the Bible says that this time will be a time unlike any other in the history of the world. It will be far worse than the Inquisition, far worse than the Roman Colosseum, and far worse than the Holocaust, all combined. Many, if not most, are not prepared for it because of the pre-tribulation teaching. Now, you say you won't take the mark, but when you see the blood dripping from that blade, still wet from the last kill, and you are next in line, are you absolutely certain that you will die for Jesus? Jesus told us to be watching. A watcher on the tower is prepared for any and all ensuing enemies. He doesn't wait to get prepared until he sees the enemy. He is already prepared while he is watching. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you each and every day strengthening your inner man for the coming persecution of all who hold the word of God and the name of Jesus of Nazareth so dear? Now, I agree that the idea of escaping the tribulation tickles the ear. It is the message we want to hear, but it is not the message of the Bible. Therefore, it must be exposed as heretical false teaching and rejected. Now, I hope in this study that as you read these prophecies throughout the Bible, even in the book of Revelation, that you will never read your Bible the same again. This is what I mean. When you read verses like in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, which say, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, which says, For even as you are called to follow the example of Jesus and his suffering for us, so must we suffer for him. And other passages like this, and there are many. I pray that you will see them in a whole new light. You will not only see them being written to the early church 2,000 years ago, but you will now see them written specifically to you because Satan is coming with such hatred and vengeance for the people of God unlike anything the world has ever known. One final point I'd like to mention here. There are two very weak arguments that I have not included or addressed. The first is that the word church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 3. Now, while this is true, Revelation does mention the word saints, and the saints are the church, and it mentions them in Revelation after chapter 3 over a dozen times. The second argument that falls weak and is offered by those who believe in the pre-tribulation view is that when John is caught up to heaven in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, they say that this represents the rapture, meaning the door is the rapture. You see, the only reason that so many refuse to teach this doctrine in their churches the way the Bible teaches it is because they are fearful of losing their ministries. If they were to go against what is so comfortable for so many Christians, regardless whether the Bible teaches it or not, they would lose their biggest donors, and most of them would be ostracized from their churches and their denominations. Friends, this is not the rapture. It is simply as it says on face value that John was caught up in the spirit to receive a revelation and visions of the end times, which are recorded for us in the remainder of the book of Revelation. Now, again, we must be careful when studying the Bible and specifically end time prophecy, not to speculate or manipulate scripture, which is clearly what is being done when one tries so hard to make the text say something it in no way says, as in John being caught up in chapter 4, verse 1. Well, I do hope that this study has helped you to see the teaching of the rapture and its timing in the prophetic timeline more clearly. 
I also hope I have given it in a way that the truth of God's word can be both clearly seen and easily digested. I realize that this is a lot of information, but as you can now see, it was critical to be dealt with in great detail and depth so that all misconceptions could be clearly answered and the truth explained thoroughly. I encourage you to study these scriptures on your own and in more detail. And remember, if I can ever help you in your search for truth, I am always available to you. Simply leave a comment in the description box below, and I would be honored and privileged to enter into discourse with you. Now, as the Lord Jesus, our great King and God wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.